Hello, I'm Chris Wynn, and welcome to a special edition of Roger Report, where today we take you back 20 odd years to a time when Sunderland would not only move hope, but go on to achieve the best back to back top flight finishes since the 1930s. From that era, Today we are privileged to be speaking to a player who came through the ranks at that time and played a major role during that amazing spell. He made 66 appearances between 1997 and 2000. I'm very pleased to be speaking to Darren Holloway. Welcome, Darren. Hi, are you all right there? I'm not too bad, mate. I don't want to touch too much on the coronavirus at the minute, but how are you coping with the lockdown? Yeah, I'm not I'm not doing too bad. I've got my lockdown haircut. I was out in the garden just the other day shaving my hair off so I've got that nailed and I'll have to obviously keep on top of that with the, the barbers being closed and I'm just like everyone else I think you get to a point where the novelty wears off a bit but obviously it's imperative that we, we follow the guidelines and, and we stick to them and we adhere to them as best we can I might be asking you for some tips when we stop recording because that's my job for the weekend to get this mop sorted on the top of my head it's, yeah, it's number, a bit ridiculous. number one number one all yeah. over that's what I went for <laughs> more maintenance yeah I'm, I'm a bit worried about that we'll see how it goes <laughs> Um, I imagine you're itching to get back on the training ground with Darlington. Yeah, I think that's the thing. I think all footballers and ex-footballers that are involved in football, they miss football. I think there's been a lot of talk about footballers at the minute. But yeah, it's, it's one thing that we do miss, whether it be playing or coaching, just to be involved in it. The banter as well as everything else. The sooner we can we can get back to some sort of normality with the season, I think everyone will be happy with that. Yeah, well, I, I want to come back to Darlington, but I'll come back to that at the end because obviously that's what you're doing now. But taking you back to the, the golden age of Britpop, um, I think... <laughs> when you were coming through the ranks at Sunderland in the first half of the 90s. I was trying to look, how old were you when you first joined the club? I left school and went into, in them days, it was a YTS scheme. So as soon as my GCSEs were done, I think I ended up signing, I think it was seven or eight months, maybe it's not even that long, of a schoolboy forms. And that was with Terry Butcher. Wow. And I mentioned this to somebody else as well. I left Manchester United School of Excellence and they didn't sign me on schoolboy forms. So they advised me dad to go to York, to take me to York. So I went to York and York had a really, really good youth set up then and had some really good players, to be fair. A lot went on to make it in the professional game. So I went down there and that's when I obviously experienced he was down there. Enjoyed playing football after the kick in the balls, you like, of getting released at Man United. And then... Obviously, son came sniffing around wanting me to sign schoolboy forms, but my dad wasn't keen on me signing schoolboy forms, to be honest, because it didn't really mean anything. It just meant that I couldn't go to other clubs. So I think it was, I just had like a, maybe a year period of just enjoying me football again. And then son in New York were backwards and forwards asking me if to sign schoolboy forms. And in the end, my dad kind of was me agent as such. I'll, I'll use that term very loosely, but. Uh, <laughs> He, he basically said to the clubs, listen, he's not interested in signing schoolboy forms. All he's interested in is the idea of a job. So a YTS, can you guarantee him that YTS scheme when he leaves school? Both clubs were adamant that that's not what they do. They, they kind of do that. But in the end, they both give in and, and basically said, yeah, we can guarantee Darren that YTS scheme. So it was a case of me then making my mind up. I think having a meeting with York, I can remember the words that he said to me at York was, you can be a big fish in a small pond here, where if you've got something, you, you might just be a, a little fish in a big pond. But to be honest, I always had faith in my ability. And obviously something's a club close to where I'm from. I'm a crook town lad. So it was something that I thought, right, yeah, I'll definitely want to get me get me teeth into that. Um, so I end up signing, like I say, I think it was maybe about six months of schoolboy forms with with the YTS to follow. Me, me mum and dad went to Roker Park to sign the forms. Prior to that, on the day, my mum took me shopping to get a blazer. I think I went into, I think it was Burton's, and I got this, what I thought was a real snazzy dog tooth blazer. So I was <laughs> over the moon with it. Turned up at Roker Park, wanted to see Terry Butcher had exactly the same blazer on. <laughs> <laughs> so luckily in that, I think it, it got put in the paper by the picture, but it wasn't in colour. So you couldn't really <laughs> tell it was exactly the same, but it was exactly the same blazer. And that, that signed me forms then at the ground and, and like I say Terry Butcher was the manager then so it seems a long long time ago that yeah. must have been I, I, I tried to think what year that was but I'd have been 16 16 leaving school at the time I'm sure he got the boot in 93, 94 something like that didn't I'm gonna, I was going to say maybe it was 90, 94 but I, I, like I say I'd have still been in school then was that George Hurd and Jimmy Montgomery running there yeah the yeah there? George brilliant loved them loved them a bit don't get me wrong some of the lads couldn't get away with them because they were very old school 
But me coming from the background that I had as a kid and, and where I was brought up, I didn't mind this. I didn't mind like the old school ways and this is what you've got to do and the, the graft you've got to put in because that was always what I thought it would be like anyway. But brilliant coaches, the pair of them. And we talked today, me and Alan Armstrong, who's gaffer at Darlington, we, we talk these days about coaches and how coaches these days don't necessarily coach your little tricks, your little tips, your little traits for individuals. And them two, to be fair, they taught me a lot. And at that age, I was like a sponge. I was always wanting to learn. So, uh, yeah, I've got a lot of time for them too. Jim's obviously still involved at the club. I mean, I've been a guest on his table a few times to watch a, a few games. But unfortunately, I've not been for a while now. I think it was last season I went. But obviously, it comes up when Darling have got games. So it's very difficult for me to get games. But yeah, can of speak highly enough for them too. And then to follow them was Ricky Sprazier come in, who obviously I bumped into at York. Another really good coach. And um, funny enough, Brian Pop Robson, mm. Pop come in. Pop was my coach at Man United School of Excellence. So I knew Pop I had must have had three years with Pop at the School of Excellence. Pop again had a lot of faith in me. He was the one champion me to get in the first team with, with Reedy the gaffer. And Pop was another great coach. I think in my time there, I was blessed, to be honest, with the coaches that we did have. Kind of talking about influences on you as you were coming through the ranks you've already rattled off kind of three or four coaches just there but were they the main ones or was there anyone else at the club who were kind of really yeah, yeah m- m- massive from from that younger age where you're trying to learn your your trade as such they were massive massive influences in my career pop obviously sticks out because I, I knew pop from the, the my united days and pop had a bit of a soft spot for me I mean, I was captain of the reserves when I was when I was still relatively young do you know what I mean and Pop had the reserves then, so he had a lot of faith in me. And like I say, he was the one championing me to to the gaffer, saying, "Listen, Darren should be playing." But it took a long time for me to actually end up playing them um, in the first team. I say a long time; it's probably not these days. But yeah. I, I was I was adamant at the time that I should have been that should have been playing a bit earlier. Like I say, I was. Uh, it, it's just one of these things. A lot of players will speak about different coaches, and they'll have an influence on you from them younger ages. I think all of them. I, I was I was keen to learn, so the all offered something a bit different and I appreciated all of their ways of coaching and how to get the best out of me and, and like I say I was very fortunate enough to, to bump into it and to work with such good coaches like them and then obviously the first team you get in you, you, you're in the round the gaffer really and, and Bobby Saxon again very good coaches and, and knowledgeable. You came through uh, just after because actually we had a really good youth setup at that time and you came in just after a kind of whole series of players like, you know, obviously Mickey Gray came through, Martin Smith, Craig Russell, or Michael Bridges as well, because he came through almost at the same time. Um, yeah. There were all those players who came through, but not only just played a handful of games, but like yourself, played a, a lot of games for the club. Who were your mates kind of in the, who did you kind of come through with when, when you were coming through the ranks? Well, funny enough, you mentioned about them having a good you set up. In, in reality, and honestly, they, they probably didn't. When I was mm-hmm. when I was there, that that probably year before me, maybe it was even two years before me, or something along them, they didn't really have a good youth set up. So it was it was difficult in terms of competing with other clubs. We, we don't get me wrong, we do all right, but we didn't have any of your stars. Obviously, you'd play the likes of Leeds and people like that, and and you'd see people like I got called into a U team game. I think I was like, see, I was playing reserves and that, so I thought my U team days were gone, and I got called to play against. Leeds and you've got Harry Kuehl and Woodgate and you had them sort of people we didn't necessarily have that quality at the time but obviously Bridgie come in a bit later because he did a year at college I think it was so he come in a bit I don't know if he did actually a full year I think he might have come out of college to, to come and play at Sunderland Sam Mason did a college stint he did a year in college and then come in but we didn't have any any lads that really kicked on and and made anything. We had um, and we had a good group as well. Don't get me wrong, we had a really good group of lads, but none of them really went on in my year to do anything in the game. We all stayed in the digs at the at the seafront, um, which was great. It was good, good crack, good, good banter. I think I was one of the oldest ones to stay in the digs. To be honest, the club kept me in the digs the longest, trying to keep me out of bother because I was coming home at weekends <laughs> and, and getting in a few scrapes, especially when I got my car, um, passed my test relatively. <laughs> relatively soon after my 17th birthday. So then I initially thought, right, I'm going to move home. I can I can travel in. I moved home, travelling in, come in on Monday after I'd been out back at Crook for a night out on Saturday or Sunday, I think it was. Got in a bit of a scrape, end up breaking my knuckle, went back to the club with a pot on my hand 
and I was told in no uncertain terms that I've got to get back in the digs. <laughs> so I had to move back in the digs, which was a good, <laughs> which was a good, a good move. To be fair, it was it, yeah. it kind of settled me down and, and made me right. This is what I need to be doing. I think I was a bit more channeled in terms of right. Yeah, work here. This is what I need to do, and I was always yeah, willing but, to do it. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard some uh, good stories from various people about the digs that I've received from. Brilliant, <laughs> back, honestly, a few, brilliant. a few years before you as well. <laughs> Yeah, 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 brilliant times. Like, I mean, don't if you get if you get a 12, 13, 14 lads in in a house, do you know what I mean? It's, it's always going to be it's always going to be fun and entertainment. Um, the family who were there as well were great. It was their first year, so we moved in their first year of, of running the place. The Mordys, Karen and Jim, brilliant. So they were like second mum and dad to me, and they had two sons, Adam and Gareth. But yeah the smashing family and we we all really enjoyed living there it wasn't a chore as you mentioned peter reed came into the club when he replaced mick books in march 95 i mean at this point you were still uh you'd still be around nine months away from making a first team squad but was it kind of easy to see how reed was changing things as soon as he came in yeah i was obviously there at, at Roper park when mick buxton and trevor hartley was his, was mm. the assistant that was my first year of yts so I, i'd seen <laughs> The club wasn't doing well. I can I can remember even fans outside shouting "sack the ball" and stuff like that. And it, it I was just fair. yeah, it just what it was. <laughs> it just wasn't seemed to be going well. And no disrespect to Mick, because I'd, I'd not Mick Books, I'd not known him that long, but he didn't come across as anyone that could really motivate lads and get them going and stuff like that. And I think I think they suffered because of that. I think when you change it and you bring Peter Reid in totally chalk and cheese and obviously really end up bringing a whole backroom staff with him as well to change it all around we were happy with it you know what I mean he's an England international played in the World Cup so in terms of respect he, he probably already had that before he walked through the door I mean I was looking and obviously you're linked I mean in my mind you're kind of linked with a, a little bit further down the line really you're talking about kind of stadium alike but I wonder if people would be surprised to hear how early on you actually made the first team squad if I have it right you, you might you might be correct on this one but I, I have it as uh, the December of Peter Reid's first full season which was 95-96 when we won the league and it was a 1-0 win at Roger Park against Crystal Palace Martin Scott penalty yeah yeah and so, I mean, it was quite early on when you started actually making the first team squads, considering I think what people kind of relate you to in terms of kind of later on in the stadium. Like you, you were actually in the, the first team squad for, for a couple of years. Right yeah, early, you know? you'll have to message me them details because I forgot that time frame. But yeah, I can always <laughs> remember the game, but it always, it, it, it's kind of grey in terms of, because I, I don't think I got on. I, was, I think I was just a sub, so it, it yeah. didn't really... It mattered, but it didn't really matter if you if you get me. But I was doing well when I got my ITS. I was doing really well. Really spoke with um, Ricky, and I ended up getting my pro contract a year earlier than I should have, basically. So I got it on my 17th birthday, which for me was brilliant. Do you know what I mean? People talk about, oh, what's your best moment at Sunderland? That, to me, was my best moment, just simply because it was what I always wanted to do. I wanted to be yeah. a professional footballer. You always aim to be a professional footballer. And like I say, I was fortunate enough to get that offered to me at 17 and I had no qualms at all signing it. I knew there was a few people interested, Newcastle, I think, but I never had any qualms of, of signing it. I, I had faith in the club, the people in it, the people coaching me. So I always thought, yeah, it's ideal for me. And lucky enough, it, it turned out that way. You mentioned that, I mean, the kind of sliding doors thing, but it, it seems like Peter Reid coming in almost kind of kept you at the club because I'm, I'm sure if we kept on going the way we were we were going before that chances are you, you probably would have left to a, a, it, it's hard a because system. do you know what I mean it's it's hard because you if you're at the club you've obviously got an affinity with that club and association people used to say to me at Sunday who do you used to support as a kid and I always used to say the same Crook Town is where I'm from and that's that's the club I supported Sun was actually the only professional club that I went to see I got a free ticket um, through school and I went to watch a game with some of my mates who used to go but I could never afford to go to watch professional football clubs in reality sometimes I couldn't even afford to watch Crook Town I used to have to nick in but they were the club that I, I classes who I supported because I, I actually went and watched them but at the time like I say when I was breaking through I wasn't after a move at, at, at any point or anything like that when I was younger but you're right it might have happened 
you know, if he'd have been kept on and things were changing or things weren't going as well as I thought they were going to go. So, yeah, it could have been, it could have been a moment where I uh, might have ended up moving or they, you never know, the club might have thought, well, hang on a minute, we'll sign him and we'll, we'll try and cash him in for a, a minority bit of money or something like that. You never know. Works both ways. Yeah. yeah. Right in the middle of that um, <laughs> that that title winning season under Peter Reid in his first full season but I imagine that looking at some of the players in that dressing room must have been a pretty tough dressing room to come through in that, at that kind of young age so how were those early experiences of getting involved in those matches they scored? Uh, it was this is the thing that's kind of it's kind of lost in football now your YTS scheme and, and I hear the I hear Man United boys like the class of 92 speak very highly of their apprentice YTS days them YTS days, they're the days that, that build you as a character because obviously you, you're cleaning boots, you're scrubbing floors, you're picking up shitty knickers. Do you know, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like yeah. Stuff like that, old kit and stuff like that. It was always thought that that's the stuff to build you to get in, to break it into a first team dress room and mix and be able to hold your own. I respected all the lads and all the pros and stuff like that, but I was always adamant that Regardless of who you you are, when I'm training, I train a, a player to win. So if I happen to kick whoever, I'll kick whoever. It, it didn't really matter to me. I can remember Niall Quinn once saying to, um, I think it was Mark Mealy. Mark Mealy kicked, I think, I don't know if it was, I can't think of something, I don't know if it was Neil Wainwright. And Quinny had a bit of a pop at him. Mealy turned around and said, well, you don't have a pop at Daz. And Quinny turned around and said, Daz kicks anyone. He's, he's not bothered. Who he, he doesn't choose who he kicks. he kicks. He kicks anyone. And I think with that, I think that gains a lot of respect from the pros as well, from the other pros. The, the getting into it and mixing, I think, was a bit easy because they held a, me in a bit of esteem as well. I think having trained with them and stuff like that, I think I think that helped. Um, I wasn't a big-time Charlie or anything like that. I didn't didn't think the world shone out my ass or anything like that. It was just a case of I was wanting to prove a point every day in training. So yeah, I think that helped got... massively with some of the some of the characters and lads that that we had in the dressing room. Yeah, yeah, uh, and it didn't... yeah, without without a doubt. And pros and that pros will do things to you. Pros will pros will hit you with a hot poker and try and get a reaction. They'll prod you with a stick and try and get a reaction. And it's how you how you react. And I think that them days defines you the YTS days is how hard it was and stuff like that it kind of shapes you as a person so in, in my view that's lost these days um, the discipline and the grounding as such but yeah I, I didn't so much have a have a problem with it I always seem to to react in in the right way um, so it obviously helped me I think uh, at this point we've got all the younger listeners laughing at us because we're we both definitely think it was better in the in the old days. It's always better in the old days. <laughs> I, but I used to, I used to think what we what's my dad talking about when he used to see oh, I was better in my day, but I'm the same now. I think I'm I think I'm morphing into him. <laughs> yeah. That season you made the bench once more and that's when it was uh, party time and the final day of the season, the Tramway Rovers obviously would won the league by then, but you were on the bench that day. So, I mean, was some of the younger lads able to get involved in some of the celebrations? When we're... <laughs> yeah, we we ended up um, winning, obviously got promoted, won the league. And if I remember right, we had um, we had a deal with the Seaburn Centre after we got promoted. So, obviously, us as young lads, like I, I was still, I must have still been with me YTS mates, so I, I must have been 18 at the time, I think, around that age, 18, 19 maybe, so I was still in the room with YTS mates, and we thought, right, free drink, do you know what I mean, it's it, it's party time, even though we didn't do much, we we had celebrated like we did, and obviously we did, but I think I was, I think I was injured after the celebration or something like that, I think I was doing a bit of work on my own in the in the home team dressing room, bit of rehab work, and Pop come in and he bollocked me about the celebrations and that, saying, "What do you think you do when walking around with a bottle, drinking out of a bottle of wine, thinking you've you've won you've won the promotion and all that?" And it, it was just one of them things. I just I, there's nothing you can do. You just call down, yeah, Pop, sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. But little did I know that the lads had already had a meeting with Brace and Pop in the away dressing room, and they were getting bollocked. Brace obviously was going round. Brace was stern, you know what I mean? Brace wasn't, Brace was just, probably didn't have that association with the young lads as, as maybe he, he should have had. He more or less kept himself to himself, so Brace was quite stern with them when he was giving them a bollock and that, so I missed that, but I got my own personal one-off pop. Um, 
when I was doing my rehab. But yeah, it was it was it was fun times. But it's nice to be around that. You know what I mean? Like I've been watching Sun until I die and that, and the difference <laughs> the difference is like unbelievable. You you think back like just at them days, like the YTS lads. Do you know what I mean? It was it was great for them, even though they weren't involved as such. They're still involved in the football club. They're still working for the football club, and I think it's just that sense of achievement. And I think it was great to have that and enjoy it. To be fair, it's not every day you become a Premier League player, is it? No, no, not at all. <laughs> Which is essentially what happened. Yeah, that's it. It's a big prize at the end. You you're allowed to you're allowed to kick your height. Um, sometimes when you and let the celebrations get a bit wild well I thought you were allowed but <laughs> well that's it I mean the following season well, well Sunderland are obviously in the Premier League we've just won the, the title and that season in the Premier League you made the match they scored once when you made the bench for the uh, 1-0 away defeat to Aston Villa I mean having been on the bench a couple of times in the kind of second tier as we went up I mean were you disappointed in the Premier League not to make the bench more often that season or were you kind of expecting it yeah like I said I always and this is not me being big headed or bullish or anything like that I, I always thought I should have been in the team I know I was, I was still relatively young but like I say I was, I was captain of the reserve side when I was young and there was people there who played like 400 league games and stuff and I was still doing well at that level so I actually thought I should have been playing not a lot but but more I should have been involved a lot more than what I was and, and that probably led on to me own move to be fair which come about Pop had a had a big say in that as well because he'd been I can't remember what year it was to be fair but he'd been on to the gaffer about playing me and seemingly I just wasn't getting that opportunity so he said it might be a good idea to go and play some league football and show everyone what you're capable of and that's how that came about Just quickly going back to that, that Villa game I'm pretty sure you made an appearance on, on Premier Passions in the dressing room for that game I think I can remember the game what you call him the Milosevic I think he yeah, played that game came off Jan Eriksson didn't it I'm sure it was his only game yeah, I, can, I can remember Sacco having a pop with some of the lads about letting them turn and and stuff like mm. that. My favourite way ground, actually, Villa Park. Love the place. It's like an old yeah. traditional stadium. The pitch is massive. All well kept. But yeah, Premier Passions, that was... Um, that yeah, was how it. was that? That was, that was entertaining <laughs> as well. How was it? Have the cameras in now? How did the lads react to it when they were told about having the cameras in? I don't think they were too bothered. I don't think they changed much. You know what I mean? I, I think they were, they were aware of them being there. But it's, it's probably harder to act abnormal than it is, than it is normal, to be fair. So I think after after a while, I think you probably just get used to them and and go back to type basically. And I think it shows. To be fair, I think it it shows how passionate and what it means to to people. Not only not only us as footballers, but but everyone else as well. It was it was a really good insight into it. To be to be perfectly honest. Yeah, it was good. It was good. But I mean, that that year we we eventually last day of the season we got relegated. Yeah, yeah it was a huge, huge blow to the city, especially the time and like leaving Walker Park and moving into the new stadium. But as you being a player who, who obviously kind of grown up through, you know, being at Roger Park, training at Roger Park, you know, seeing that for, for that long, not being one of the new players, how did you find the build-up moving to the stadium line in that summer? It was very, it was very difficult after getting relegated because everyone wanted us to be in the top league in this new stadium. I actually played, we played Liverpool in the last game at Roger Park and I, I think I, Played or come on sub in that game, so I played a part in that game. It holds fond memories. Wrote a part. Obviously, that's where that's where I started. But the the move, I think, we we're all looking forward to it. I mean, the the plans that we'd saw and everything like that, and this new stadium. Do you know what I mean? I think everything like that kind of got the blood flowing. Um, it was just a, obviously it was just a shame that we weren't in the top league when we were starting the season off in it the beginning of that season as you mentioned you did go on loan to Carlisle you said Pop Robson was was he kind of pushing you into that or was that something you pushed for yourself and said I need to get some games because you still hadn't made your kind of professional debut at this point no it was it was Pop was probably pivotal in that um, basically said listen I've been in to see the gaffer and I've been in numerous times to get you in the first team and he said you're not getting an opportunity and Pop was the one actually I was playing centre half all the time and Pop was the one who turned around to me and said do you think you can play right back and I said I don't know he said I think you, you might have an opportunity of getting in the first team at right back so prior to me going on loan I started to play right back I think it was so the loan come about I was I was keen to go and play I wanted to play football do you know what I mean it's, reserve team football as good as it was then and it's probably better than under 23s football now you, you want to play league football that's what you that, that's what you want to be a footballer for so the opportunity came about. I went to Carlisle, which was 
Michael Knighton, if you can remember him. Can you remember him? Yeah. Who was yeah. Man United, yeah. keeping the juggling the ball up. Yeah, yeah. He was a yeah. Carlisle. He was a Carlisle chairman. Um, so yeah, well at some point. Yeah, I think he did. He had. A, he had. A, I think. Well, it might have not. Mad, no, was it in my? No, it wasn't. But Mervyn Day, funny enough, was manager, and Mervyn got sacked, and it was two days into my loan. Now, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, it was a blessing for me. I, don't get me wrong; I didn't have anything against Mervyn, but um, I went there, and he played me right wing back. I've never played right wing back, and uh, as long as I've got a hole in my ass, I wouldn't be able to play right wing back. I wasn't the right <laughs> wing back. I was a converted <laughs> centre half to right back, so yeah. I'm not going to be comfortable playing right wing back. But anyway, yeah. we played we played Wigan, and I was running me bollocks off up and down. He, he was kicking goal kicks onto me, and so to flick on, I was running back, and I was knackered. So I, and I thought, you know what? That's not doing me any justice, really. I'm that's not my game. So I went and seen him, and I said, "Listen, I'm not a, I'm not a wing back. Like I say, as long as I've got a hole in my ass, I'll never be a wing back. I, I'm a right back, if anything, or a centre half." And he said, "Oh, you did great. You did brilliant." And I thought, "Yeah, but I, I can do better in my more familiar position." He's like, "Oh, no, no." And we played Blackpool away. He said, "Oh, see how you get on." We got beat. I think it was a Blackpool away by I think it was one goal. We got beat. Might have been one nil, two one, and um, he got sacked. So they end up giving it to caretaker managers who were doing it at the time. Um, and they basically asked me and said, Darren, where do you want to play? And I went right back. And that was it. And did really well in right back to the point that they actually put a bid in for me, which would have been their record signing. It was 400 and 425 grand it was at the time. So I had uh-huh. I had five or six games there, went back to Sunderland and Sunderland knocked it back. So that was that. Was that. So then I went in and and knocked on the gaffer's door and said, "Well, if you're knocking that back, I need to be playing. That's me now, and I need to be, I need to be playing." And I don't think it was that long after me loan that I ended up getting, getting a sniff. Well, that, that's it, because um, Chris Megan, who was brought in that summer, we start off a bit iffy that season. He gets injured in a goalless straw at home to Swindon, and I think you're either recalled or your loan finishes, and Sunderland are sitting eleventh in the table, and we've lost five of the first twelve. And then you're thrown straight into the starting eleven um, for your full debut in a tough away game at, at Stoke City. I mean, did you go into it nervous, or were you thinking, yeah, it's, it's about time? More, probably more so. It was about time, to be honest. Yeah. But obviously, you are nervous because it's your first team debut. I just wanted to prove a point. It's, it's like everything that I say to lads now when they go out. You, you've got to prove a point all the time you train or all the time you you play games. You, you're constantly trying to prove a point. You're trying to prove how how good or how capable you are as a footballer. So for me, it was, uh, yeah, I was I was nervous, but on the on the flip side, I thought this is what you've been working for all that time. And to be fair, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I think I can remember. I think I got the ball off the keeper one time and and ended up giving it away. And I thought, do you know what? Fuck it, I'm going to go and get the ball again. So I went and got the ball again. And I passed it, and I thought. There's no point hiding. If you're going to make mistakes, you, you make mistakes. If I hide, then that'll do myself no favours. But no, I thoroughly enjoyed it and, and never looked back after that that debut to start. Yeah. I mean, it was amazing that, you know, after that start, like I said, I mean, what, what did I say? It was um, lost five of the first 12, sitting in mid-table. Peter Reid's under pressure. He throws you in. He throws Darren Williams in. He yeah. throws Jody Craig into that back four. Um, youngest, all young lads. Youngest. Youngest back four, I think it was at the, t- at the time yeah. for a good, good while. Um, yeah. I can remember, oh, funny enough, we were. I was, I was sat. We we got beat at Redden away, I think it was. Yeah, and I was, now. I was, yeah, and I was one that didn't make the bench that day. So I was sat in the stand watching the game, and we, we were terribly defensively. And that was, I think, that kind of was a straw that brought the camel back for the gaffer. We all come into it, young lads, with with no fear. That was it. We were. We, we basically had no fear and we, we were wanting to prove a point and fortunately enough for us it, it worked out way Was that the message from kind of reading Saxon was it like the shirt to yours you know kind of go and take it though? Yeah I think I think we all everyone I think they were they were fair in that sense I think if you performed you keep your place so we knew that we, we we knew that we'd have to perform better than probably just average because average we didn't have anything to fall back on we didn't have 100 league games to fall back on do you know what I mean to say oh we knew that we'd have to keep performing and have to keep working hard and, and doing it in training as well and I think it, it worked the energy that we had and the the formula that we had as a team 
was great. We were confident. Like I say, we, we didn't have any fear. And confidence plays a massive part in football. Yeah, and I didn't realise until I looked it up, but um, I was actually at your first two games. <laughs> I was at uh, I was at that Stoke game um, because it was a I'm sure I'm sure it was that year because there was a huge snowball fight outside the, the outside their ground after. Um, but I might have the wrong year, but I'm sure it was that one. And then your second game, I was definitely at your second game. That was your second game was away to Stockport when Lee Clark equalised in the last minute, and uh, I ended up on the pitch celebrating. But that, that's a, that's a different story. <laughs> uh, um, someone just yeah, someone so, just mentioned me. Sorry, someone just mentioned to me a reporter for the Northern Echo. I think Craig Stoddard mentioned that that might have been the game where Alan Armstrong was was playing the Stockport side. Yeah, he, he said. Yeah. He said. Um, Craig said, "Oh, you got booked." He said, "I was hoping that you might have gotten booked for kicking Allen." I went, "No," I said, "I can't remember it to be honest." I said, "So I have no idea." I might check if he scored. <laughs> I can't remember <laughs> where I was. I hope he didn't. If he did, I'm not going to tell him anyway. Okay. It was it was Jim Gannon on 79, but he did nah. play. He played up front. He played up front <laughs> with Brett Angel. <laughs> um, so there you go. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, for for the rest of that season, I mean, you you kind of basically Jordy Craddock and Darren Williams, all all three of you didn't really look back. You started thirty seven times um, that season, and we only lost three games for the rest of the season. I mean, that that must have been an amazing team to play in, especially being your first full season as a first team player. Is that right? I'll have to remember that. I'll have to keep. I'll have, I'll have to remind people of that. Three games, yeah. thirty seven. Well, it was just a it was just a great time. Do you know what I mean? Like I said, the formula of the team, I think really was getting it right in terms of what he wanted it to look like and what sort of players he was he was bringing in. Football is one of these funny things. You've got to get everything kind of right in the mix to allow you to go and be successful. And I think he was he was, he was was getting to that stage with who he was bringing in and what sort of characters they were and, and the dress room and the, the team morale was, was really good. So it was, it was good times. It was really good times. I think if you speak to any of the lads who were, we're in and around them three, three or four years. They'll probably say the same as what I say, and it's, it's probably the best, best time of your, my career. Um, and many of them say the same thing. Like you said, you went from strength to strength, and, and towards the end of that season, um, you were playing so well. Toward, it was um, at the end of March, um, you got called up to the England under-21 squad to, to play Switzerland. Um, you were playing along the likes of uh, Jamie Redknapp, Frank Lampard, Jimmy Carragher. So how was that experience? It was kind of, it, it was classed as a, I don't know if you can remember these, but it was classed as like a, an England B international um, right. because obviously all of them lads were a lot lot older. It was um, Jimmy Redknapp, Nicky Barmby, Dominic Matteo actually played. <laughs> Shaka, 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 his lot as yeah. well, I think it was as well. So yeah, we and, and it was great for me. I think it was just, it was, it was one of them rewards where you think, wow, do you know what I mean? Wow, these are top, top players. And I can remember at the time, Glenn Hoddle was looking at Jamie Redknapp was playing sweeper to take it into the, I don't know if it was a World Cup or Euros after that year. So it was because it was the summer of 98, so it was going into the World Cup in 98. Yeah, well, he was looking, he was looking, playing Redknapp as a sweeper, like obviously Hoddle used to do when he swinging days and stuff like that. Jamie had obviously really good range of passing, was comfortable on the ball. But I think Jamie got injured prior to the tournament, so that never came about. But it was it was great and it was really good experience for me to be training with the likes of some of them names and watching them. Do you know what I mean? And just seeing because they were don't get me wrong, they were top players. I was still basically as far as I was concerned, I was still learning. Do you know what I mean? I was still trying to get somewhere near. So it was it was great to. To see them train and that, and some of the lads were doing stuff that I could only dream of doing. But um, it was it was a great experience for me. Me yeah. and Daz, to be fair, we both I think we both went that time. Yeah, you, me, me and you, Daz both, you both got on. Yeah, you both got yeah. on. So it was um, it was Shaka Hislop, Kieran Dyer, Steve Guppy, uh, John Curtis, Jimmy Redknapp, who who you actually you ended up coming on a sub for him. Um, yeah, again, Dominic Matteo, uh, Frank Lampard, Nigel Quasi, Pesky, and Barmby and Trevor Sinclair. I should have fucking scored. I should have scored that that day as well. I, I, I keep I, it keeps playing on my mind constantly, you know, because I had a really good chance and I and I fizzed it past the I fizzed it past the post and I should have scored. Oh. Even to this day, it keeps it keeps gnawing away at me. Every time I think of that game that that day, I was thinking, oh, I should have, that really should have scored. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, got got beat two 0 Just in case uh, anyone didn't want to not score there. <laughs> so anyway, um, back to Sutherland. Uh, we end up uh, missing out on automatic promotion by a point to Middlesbrough, even though we ended up with ninety points, which was a, a, a shocker. But then we go on to the playoffs, and after a two-one defeat to Sheffield United in the first leg at their place in the playoff semi-final, 
Um, we bring them back to the Stadium of Light on the Wednesday night in the fog. Now, I was there, but for those who maybe weren't there, and maybe to remind people who, who actually were there, could you describe what it was like to play in an atmosphere like that? It was the best. People people say to me about, oh, what's your favourite favorite ground to play at and stuff like that. And I would say the stadium, the stadium light. And that one in particular, that atmosphere was electric. It was unbelievable. Don't get me wrong, we had some really good... I can remember we had we played Bradford City over... It was a Boxing Day on New Year's Day and that atmosphere then was was terrific. But on this on this occasion and because of the occasion as well it was it was frighteningly good it's absolutely I, I went a few years back with my eldest son to the stadium and honestly I, I i feel sorry for some of the supporters that have never experienced the atmosphere that uh, we were used to as, as players because it just it's not comparable and it hasn't probably been for for a number of years but that probably boils down to not having a, a very successful team as well but it was it was electric it was electric on the night on the night it was on the day it was unbelievable. Completely hit the nail there. I mean, I, I took my little lad to his first game last year, but I remember my first game where you know you know hairs on the back of your neck were standing up and you were it was just my the eyes were popping out of my head because the noise and everything like that and games like that just were just, were just unreal and complete utter. It was just an experience, but. Yeah, I've never, I've never experienced an atmosphere like that. I mean, just everything came together that one night, and it was just, uh, it, it was, was just... it was frightening. We used to love, we, we, we never had any trepidation about falling behind in a game of football, and that the, the fans used to to roar us on, so we'd be attacking, we'd be, we'd be constant, we'd, we'd wear teams down, and that, and we just feel that that energy from the from the fans. So we never, probably that stage, we never thought when we went down in football games at the stadium, we, we were never really nervous as such. We never thought, worst case scenario, we always, and because the fans never thought that as well. And they had the mindset of, yeah, we'll score, we'll turn it around, we'll turn it around. The whole atmosphere and, and the energy about the place was, was terrific. Really was. The, the prize for that was setting up that uh, Wembley final against Charlton yes. um, so yes. but I mean if you think about it you know it's the end of your first full season and you've got what some people call as one of the biggest games in football at the end of your first full season and can you remember much about the build-up for the game yeah it was um, it was a strange one because I, I was suffering with a with a bad back prior to the to the semi-final playoff I was probably nervous about that because it was it was hindering me somewhat so the build-up to it was still very exciting for me and but I had that in the back of my mind playing away um, but I can remember we were, we were getting obviously got fitted for suits and that the lads and I, I used to to shop at um, I think it was one of the top clothes shops in Newcastle and the lads ended up giving me money to go and buy the sunglasses um, <laughs> so we had, a, we had a kitty and we, we all got kitted out in sunglasses and that obviously the suits and the whole build-up was was brilliant. I remember really saying to us as young lads and that, saying, "Oh, appreciate and acknowledge the the moment," um, because he said, "I never when I first come here." And to be honest, you kind of think, "What's he talking about?" But I, I, I can honestly say now that I never appreciated the moment, and I wish I and I wish I took more appreciation of it because obviously it was Wembley. Do you know what I mean? Um, and like you say, one of the one of the biggest games. It was just unfortunate we come out on the wrong side of it. Uh, you ended up coming off at uh, at half time with with your back injury. I mean, was that? I imagine that was pretty tough to accept at the time because these games don't come around that, that often. Yeah, it was a, it was a kick in the balls for me to be honest. And even to this day, I, I regret. I, I end up not doing a proper warm up. Like had had loads of exercise to do and that, and he end up we had a we had a mascot at the time and looked all lonely. So I was just having a kick about with a mascot when probably I should have been doing a bit more rigorous warm-up. Um, I think I got caught cold and I got booked early on, which didn't help. And then obviously got dragged off at, dragged off at half-time. But not many people know I was I was due to be one of the first five penalty takers as well in that day. <laughs> oh. we'd, we'd been practising and um, we'd had a, we had a five to start with, but obviously that, that changed as well. I got I, I come off. I think Kev come off as well. Um, Lee Clark came up. Yeah, so there's. I think that was probably three of the. That might have been three of the five that we're initially going to take. 
I mentioned, uh, <laughs> I mentioned, I was talking to, we talked to Jody Craddock about this. It sounded like him and Darren Williams was, was standing next to each other in the centre circle, basically trying, trying not hiding eye way. contact with it. Yeah, yeah, basically. But they, yeah. they said they were waiting for da- uh, Danny Ditchio to step up before them, but I they think, weren't convinced he was actually going to put his hand up. I think, I think, I think, Ditch, I think Ditch actually took his shoes off, took his boots off, I think. I think that's how much he wanted to take one. It's tough, don't get me wrong, like, it's tough. And yeah. if you'd have asked me, if Mickey was going to miss a penalty with his wand of a left foot, I'd have turned on and said no. But it's probably the worst penalty I've, I've seen. But that's uh, that's the pressure scenario. You've got a Sunderland lad taking a penalty in front of what was it, seventy, eighty thousand people. Nine times out of ten, if you ask him to do it, he'll be able to he'll be able to stick it in the onion bag. But on this occasion, obviously the pressure and the enormity of the game just got to him, and he didn't. He, he wasn't able to to stick it away. Yeah, well, we'll, um, we'll leave that. We'll leave that. Uh, we'll leave that there. But uh, after you returned from the kind of summer break, I mean, how, how did you find that the training ground? Were people still suffering after, after Wembley when, when everyone got it, back? It, it was hard. I ended up not not going off the rails as such, but it was it, it, it was hard. I knew I knew Mickey probably went off the rails a bit. Maybe one or two was not off the rails bad, but like hit the drink and tried to tried to forget it and and stuff like that and I think that takes a bit of time and then you get over it and then you, your mindset's got to be right and I need to get fit now I think usually we had maybe 10 days to a fortnight of of not doing anything that was your rest and then obviously then you have to pick up your your, your training regime so you can maybe have that week of feeling sorry for yourself and uh, and drowning in drink and then you've got to get back into into a routine and um, try and get fit and that's Basically, what what I did, I ended up having that week of feeling sorry for myself and thinking what if and and all this and that, and then it was a case of right, this is what I've got to do. This is my training regime, and try to do it to ready to get get fit again at the start of start of pre season. But obviously, you played all those games. You played a major part in getting us to that playoff final and kind of turning it around that season. But you picked up kind of a major injury. Was it to do with your back in, in yeah, pre season? Yeah, it was. It was me back. It was me back. We, we, I think we were down the West Country, down Exeter or somewhere like that. I think we we're Plymouth and places like that. I think we were in that pre season. That's where we went. And I was, I was struggling. And my agent, funny enough, rang me and said, um, "What's up with you?" And I went, "What do you mean?" And he said. I've just spoke to Reedy and Reedy's convinced that you're not right. There's something wrong with you. And I just said, me back. So me back's, me, me back's hindering me. It's, it's killing me. So I had to go and speak to Reedy. I went and sp- spoke to the gaffer and said, gaffer. He said, I know, he said, I can tell. He said, I can tell. He said, you kind of pull the wool over anyone's eyes. He said, right, we'll get you. We'll send you back home. Um, and we'll try and get to the get to the root of it. But it, it, took, it took forever. I must have seen about five different specialists one was wanting to give me an epidural i seen one in harley street there was quite a number that we that we'd seen but nothing was kind of freeing it up as such and that's when i ended up going to to, to lillishaw i had two weeks at lillishaw and just through pure mobilization and, and getting it moving they end up freeing it up somewhat so then i was ready to to start a bit of a bit of rehab but i think in total it was it was a good number of months where i was where I was out from from start to finish, which was obviously a kick in the bollocks when you when you've had that that good season prior. It was about six months really, wasn't it? All in all, but yeah. How did you find it? Because um, it must have been kind of bittersweet because the team were flying. I mean, getting over hundred points that season, but did that make it worse? Yeah, yeah. It's it's. It, I was one of these, and I never liked watching. I, I I never never ever enjoyed watching. I always wanted. To, I was always kicking every ball and stuff like that so for me not to be to be playing and that was it was heart wrenching and to be to be fair it was a, it was a long do you know what I mean it's six months but it was a long six months because we were doing so well and I should have been part of that that group doing so well so in that in that sense it was it was really a, a kick in the balls for me but it was something that every footballer goes through if you if you don't if you don't pick up an injury in football, you, you're very fortunate. Unfortunately, I picked up a few, um, and that was one of the, the major ones that kept me out for six months. You're now back uh, as, a, as a Premier League player <laughs> because you're kind of going back fit, suddenly to be promoted. But we're bringing in the likes now, you know, almost like a next level of player. We're bringing in Steve Ball, Stefan Schartz, Thomas Helmer, um, which are all players who've been there and done it and were brought in to help us cope with the Premier League. But what I wanted to ask was, 
And now <laughs> there's a bit of a caveat to this because other than Phillips and Quinn, which every player who we talked to around this era kind of comes straight out with, who were the kind of best players you played alongside at Sunderland? Oh, oh, oh that's a tricky question. I, I, honestly, I think Baldy was obviously a great player, but I didn't get to play a lot with Baldy. Thomas Helmer, obviously German international, um, and I and I end up funny enough, I end up playing a bit of football with Thomas in reserves, and Thomas was cool, cool as a cucumber, but. The gaffer didn't really fancy him. I think I played in his debut, and I think it might have been Leeds away. And I think it was a young Alan Smith. I think ran him ragged, and I think after that, really just didn't didn't quite fancy him. But listen, we had we had like some really good players. Do you know what I mean? Like really good players. I can, Paul Shute was one of my favourite when he was playing at, at Tottenham and stuff like that. We had him at Sunderland. We obviously had um, John O on one side with Mickey Gray, who were who were you, they were like telepathic. John Orr never had much pace, but always seemed to get crosses in and was quality off both feet. And then you had the right side of, of Buzzer, one of the laziest men in football. <laughs> 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 to be fair, Buzzer, I ended up playing with Buzzer again at Bradford when he was a bit older. And he ran more when he was older than he did when he was when he was younger <laughs> at Sunderland. But to be fair, he was the quality of his passing and crossing was absolutely phenomenal. People get on about Bex and that. Buzzer was yeah. just a, a poor man's Bex. His, his delivery was unbelievable. We had some good midfielders, like obviously Stefan, Clarkey, Don Hutch, Gav McCann, who played for England, good mate of mine. It's a good group, do you know what I mean? Yes, the, the two that stick out for you is Quinny and, and Kev. But I, I, honestly, I think the, the group that really ended up getting was just a really, really good group and shows with it with the quality that I mentioned there. Yeah, you mentioned Alan Johnson. I, I just always thought it was a shame we didn't say Alan Johnson in the Premier League. But yeah, well, Jono, Jono ended up obviously got his head turned with, with the move back up to Scotland and that didn't go down too well with yeah. with Reedy. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> no, it didn't yeah. go down too well with Reedy at all. Um, and I felt sorry for, for John because great lad, really good, sound lad, good mixer with the lads and stuff like that. And I, and I did, I, f- I felt a bit sorry for him towards the end when he was, when he'd made his mind up because that was kind of, once he'd made his mind up, that was kind of really cut all ties basically instead of probably using him until he went. We didn't do too bad without him to be fair. <laughs> but, no. But still, it's still a shame. Um, but yeah, I mean, during that season uh, back in the Premier League, I mean, you, you, you get involved in the in the squad, and towards the December, you actually come on as substitute in a pretty epic game at the stadium, like in the the four one demolition of Chelsea, um, where I imagine kind of all the lads because you were on the bench that day, but I imagine all the lads next to you were itching to get on when we're four 0 up at half time. Yeah, it was a strange one that people people get on about it and that. And I, to be fair, it was only just recently that I remembered that I'd that I'd played a part <laughs> in it. It's it's like I said earlier on when you don't play, or at the time I probably thought I should have been playing. So being a sub and coming on didn't matter as as much. Can't forget these little scenarios. But to be honest, it was a, obviously some great goals. I mean, you, you look you look at the goals and that's some some great finishes and that. And obviously the mighty Chelsea and getting them up the stadium night and taunting them <laughs> doesn't happen doesn't happen every um, week. So. Yeah, it was it was great to be involved in. Came on for the last five minutes for for Nicky Summer. So, Made all yeah, the like, difference. You, you were the last five minutes. <laughs> yeah. You were the only sub to get on. Really? Yeah, that's yeah. that's tight. That's tight already. Only and, one to uh, one when you're taunting them. What was it? It was a young bench. You had yourself. You had John Oster, Thomas Butler, and Michael Reddy on the bench. So, wow, that is a, that is a young bench. I remember third. I think third started that game. Third. Well, well, yeah, I was about to say, I was sent midfield was uh, Eric Roy and Paul Thurwell, I think. Yeah, yeah, wow, that is a, that is a young bench, to be fair. I mean, it makes it even better, to, I suppose, with what we had out. Yeah. But, I mean, you got on in that game, but a few weeks later, you went on loan to Sam Aldice's Bolton Wanderers for a month. So how did that come about, and, and what was it like for playing for, for Sam Aldice at the time? Yeah, it was um, it was a strange one. That was, I think, it was around about Christmas time, if I remember right. And it January, was, I think. It was one of them where I was itching to play again, so they thought it was a good idea for me to get some some games of fitness to hopefully try and edge me way back into the into the squad. There went to Bolton. Obviously, Sam Sam was really good. I thought from from him being an old school big head of kick at centre half, I think some of his training methods were really really. Beyond his way beyond his, his time and that, I think they were they were ahead of the game. Had some really good players there as well. Do you know what I mean? Good Johnson was there, and then I enjoyed it to to an extent. But I was always itching to get back, so I probably should have done better there than I than I did. 
I think it was because my mind was was probably just itching to, to get back and get involved back up at Sunderland. Um, but it was a good experience for me and, and did me did me no harm, to be perfectly honest. Well, probably, I imagine you were watching what was going on here because we were flying um, and we, we went on to finish seventh that season. But towards the end of the season, you had a run of about eight consecutive games in the start and 11 where you, you were kind of thrown in and you kind of had kept your place for, for that run of games. But after that run in the side, what were your thoughts at the time? Were you kind of, because you seemed to be in and out, were you aiming to cement a place in the side or... Were you, were you thinking? Do I need to make a move here? No, I was. I was never. I was never itching to get away. I was never. That was never crossed my mind. I always wanted to to fight for my place, and I think that was that was what I was all about. I was just wanting to to prove a point and to to earn to earn my place on the side. I think I end up getting played quite a few positions, so then it's hard to get any momentum in certain in your certain position. Sometimes I was used coming on centre half, sometimes in midfield, sometimes right back, um, which probably didn't help as such. But I, I there was no there was no chance of me wanting to to get away or anything. I'd never never spoke to anybody about that. Um, I was just wanting to to obviously look to to cement the place the following the following season. Well, yeah, then that, that following season, so two thousand two thousand one. Uh, we start the, uh, the first home game. I think it was. I think it was Arsenal. You started the first five games of the season. Yeah, and we I think, bullied. We bullied Arsenal at the stadium. Yeah. So you played. That's it. You started the first five games, and it yeah. looked. I mean, I, I might have this wrong, but it looked like for kind of quite a few of those games, you were playing centre mid field with uh, with Paul Thurwell for most of those games. I ended up playing centre mid. It was kind of like a kind of like a holding centre mid, but it was. It, it, I I got asked sometimes. I mean, in the in the Arsenal game, I got asked to mark. Canu, so that was my job. So I was man marking him, basically stop him playing, um, stop him having an effect on the game, which I, I didn't mind. Like I said, we we ended up bullying them. So every time we got near him, I was just trying to kick him up a height and and spoil his game. And in the end, I think I, I don't know if he got took off. So I obviously did my job then, and we obviously won the game. But basically, they had a, a team full of stars, but we we just bullied them, and then. In other games, I was asked to play that, that midfield role and it was a case of, right, if Mickey bombs on there, you go and fill into a left-back position and do a job. And and it was, I, I don't get me wrong, I, lo- I, like, I love playing midfield. I used to love playing midfield when I was younger, but it was, like I say, it was, it was a bit different for me in terms of not being your, your, your probably your, your average midfield role. Um, got asked to do a lot, of, a lot of different things involved in that role. Um, but I enjoyed it nevertheless. And like I said, it was you start and give in the Premier League so what's not to enjoy what I found weird though or a bit strange when looking back at kind of you starting those five games if I have the dates right I might be completely wrong with the dates but about three weeks after you start five games in a row at the start of the season you were then sold to Wimbledon but it just seems odd looking back that you, you know you made the start in 11 for the first five games you were still you were just coming up to your 23rd birthday so you're still young and it was still early in the season but it just seemed odd that you were just suddenly suddenly sold. I mean, was it that uh, it had been on the cards or was it just out of the blue? <laughs> no, no, not at all. It was it was really out of the blue. Really, I'd, I'd, I'd got told that really had accepted an offer from, from Wimbledon, which I just basically said, well, I'm, I'm not interested. I'm what, what, why do I? I'm a, I'm a crook town lad. Why do I want to move down to the, to the, <laughs> to the smoke? Why do I want to move down to London? No, not, not interested. Right. Um, my agent rang me, mentioned the same thing. I said, "No, no, I'm not interested." At that time, I'd, I'd been—I think I'd been dropped out of the team, and then really changed changed character in terms of I always got on really well with, with the gaffer, but on this occasion, he was adamant that I was going. I said, "No, I'll wait. I'll play reserves, and I'll wait for someone further up north to come in for me." And he said, "No, I won't play in reserves." Now, bearing in mind, I'd seen what happened to um, John O and, and Bridgie and how he, how he tread them. I wasn't keen to follow suit. Uh, I was a bit more, probably a bit more fiery than, than them two. And I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been happy of doing some of the things that, that they had to do. So it, it was a tricky, it was a tricky scenario for me. I spoke to my agent, but unbeknown to me, I didn't, my agent was really good mates with Reedy. So that was a mistake on my part. But me being a young naive lad who'd never had any sort of agent or advice previously as far as I was concerned he was an agent that was going to look after my best interests but I just thought I was getting pushed by both to be fair 
by obviously Reedy and, and my agent. But it was just a case of Reedy basically saying, you're not going to play reserve team football, you, you're not going to play. And, and that that hurt, to be fair. I thought, why? What's the... I, I couldn't fathom out no rhyme, no reason to it. Even to this day, I haven't got a, haven't got a scooby too. Why, why that was. Like I said, just started the first five games just shy of me 23rd birthday I think it was so it was it was strange for me in the end I got talked into going to speak to Wimbledon spoke to them they were offering me more money I wasn't on great money at Sunderland anyway but they were offering me more money than what I was getting at Sunderland um, but again I went back and I was no I'm not I'm not really that interested Wimbledon had just getting relegated so they were playing in the championship I think if, if it was a championship it might have been division one then so it wasn't it wasn't something that I was I was mad keen on doing. I wanted to I wanted to stay, but it just kept, it, it felt basically like I was getting getting forced out, and um, it kind of felt like I got pushed into a corner where I had to. This was this was the move. So then I looked at it and thought, okay, well if I go down there, maybe I can get a move again. But unfortunately, it didn't it didn't work like that. But no no at no point did I ask for a move or was I expecting a move or anything like that. I think I think Bobby Saxton I, I think he was under the impression as well that it was it wasn't the right thing to do. Um when I spoke to Sacco, he I don't think he was singing from the same hymn sheet as as Reedy. So it it was strange. Like it, it really was like looking back it was I kinda of think should I have bit the bullet and done it and and just seen what happened or or what? But hindsight it's no good to anybody. But no it was it was never. It was never something that I was. I was wanting. It was kind of just something that was that was forced upon me as such. Even like I said, even because I, I remember from the time that obviously you were just sold. But when I was looking at the games that you played, and then suddenly a few weeks later, kind of gone. It was. It just seemed strange on paper. You, especially a young local lad as well that was playing games, mm-hmm. and you know it wasn't. I mean, it, don't get us wrong. It was a lot of money. Some something around the region about one and a half million. So it wasn't exactly. kind of yeah, one point two five or something. Kind of, yeah. So it wasn't kind of mega books that Peter Reid was going to go out and spend a ten million buy a no. ten million pound player or anything. So I did, yeah, it just seemed a strange one looking at looking at the game. So I mean, do you think that impacted your career that you you weren't allowed to move kind of on your terms that you weren't presented with a club that you thought oh yeah that they're a club for me with the, with the gaffer and everything I'm I'm into that and that you did it impact you that you had to make that move. Yeah, it, it, yeah. I think it, I think it would on anyone. I think as a footballer, you'd like to be in charge of your, or hopefully in charge of your destiny as such. It wasn't something like I say. I'm I'm a I'm a town. I'm a crook town lad. Do you know what I mean? I'm I'm not a I'm not a city city boy. Um, so it was it, it was it was quite daunting to be fair. But I had to just get me just get me head around it. It kind of took away. I think, it, in all honesty, it probably took away. I don't know why, but it probably took a bit, a bit of fire in my belly away. Maybe it's because of how I was treated, or maybe it's just because I had an, an affinity and a relationship with the lads that had, that were at Sunderland. So we were always tw- trying to outdo each other as such, in terms of like um, training and, and stuff like that. Um, and I probably never had that again at, at, at Wimbledon. I went down there and I got there with the chairman and the manager with chief executive were chatting about, oh, this is what we're going to do. Bearing in mind, they were still ground sharing with um, Crystal Palace at Sellers Park. Um, they were saying that they were going to get a stadium. They were going to do this. They were going to do that. And they had some good players, Jason Newell, John Hartson. And I thought, you know what? They, they might have a chance of, of getting even back up in the Premier League. But unfortunately, that wasn't to be. I think we, we, we underachieved probably for what we had. And I think we missed that. I think we must have finished about 10th or something in that first season and then things just started to to go downhill a bit in terms of the club and and what they were what their ambitions were yeah yeah it went uh, went pretty completely changed club and location after that so yeah it was it mad completely though. yeah but i mean after, after wimbledon you had spells at uh, bradford like you mentioned darlington gateshead um before you before you finished up um and then you you moved into coaching was it was it always on the cards that you'd get into coaching or was it just a decision you made when, when you stopped no, it was uh, it was um, something that I'd always thought of doing, um, and I wish I'd have took. I wish I'd have started me coaching badges when I was playing. I think I tried to when I was at Darlington, but we never we never got enough lads to do it. Um, but it was always something that I was 
interested in doing and I was a, I was always a good talker I thought I, I soaked up a lot of lot of knowledge from different coaches so it was something that I, I had an ambition to do once I once I'd finished playing football so that was always a, an ambition of mine it it come about and it obviously a bit of a different way I'm I'm now assistant manager at Darlington and and a coach I'm head of football down at East Durham College in Pete Lee and it was a very very slow build up to to getting on the coaching ladder to be perfectly honest I've worked in Millersburg Academy and Hartpool Academy and it's just something that you've got to cut your teeth with I think unless you unless you're in a privileged position and someone puts a a job on your tours then you've you've just got to try and cut your teeth at the at the lower end and, and work your way up I set my own coaching academy up at my old comprehensive school Parkside Willington years and years back because I always wanted to put something back into the into my local community and um, did that enjoyed doing that and like I said it was just a bit of a, a slow burner to to where I am where I am now and hopefully it'll, it'll continue to grow you mentioned Middlesbrough that, that, that's that's where you met Alan Armstrong wasn't it working in, at the academy in Middlesbrough no we used to we used to play at Darlington together and we used to travel in together oh. Al, Al lives at um, Wolsingham so me being I was at Crook at the time so we used to travel in together um, when we were at Darlington if you'd have asked me if Alan was ever going to be a manager then I'd have I'd have laughed I'd have said no chance <laughs> not a chance <laughs> But he's talked to it like a like a duck to water. To be to be fair, and he's done really well with it. But Al spent a lot of years coaching at, at Middlesbrough, and that's where we we bumped into each other again. And he got offered the Blythe Spartans job, um, which he asked me if I'd I'd be interested in being his assistant there. At that moment, coaching at Middlesbrough and having me full time job at Eastern College, it, it was a lot on my plate. And I said to him, "Listen, mate," I said, I, "I said I've got a lot on. I said get your feet under the table. If you still want me to come up, I'll." I'll I'll think about it. Sure enough, he, he asked me, um, and I said, "Listen, can I can I come up and just get a just a feel for it?" He said, "Yeah, by all means." So I come up. I was in the dress room and that, and I thought, you know what, this is this is this is more like it. It's it's real football. No disrespect to academies and that, but it, real football is is what floats my boat. Where you you're trying to win a game of football at at any cost, basically um, within reason, and I think that's that that kind of that sparked a, a huge interest in me. So with that, I end up saying, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll come up. Um, but it was a hard juggling act for that year. Cause I would like to say it was, it was three different, three different jobs I was doing. So it was very really time consuming, but worth it in the end. You can from strength to strength. I mean, as a, as a kind of partnership, I mean, you brilliant, uh, did brilliant, uh, Blythe Spartans and then moved on to, to Darlington last summer. And, uh, obviously before all this kind of took hold, um, you were in with a chance of making the playoffs in there. Yeah, and I noticed you had a got a couple of excellent players um, in there. We've got Michael Little and uh, uh, Lewis Lang. Yeah, we've got a, we've got a few. Jordan Jordan Watson's another one who was at Sunderland. Yeah, we've got we've got a few good good lads. To be fair, I know Langy. Obviously, I was um, Hartley Pull train at, at the at the college in Peter Lee, so I knew I knew Langy from from watching them train. Um, Lids, obviously, we had a we had a Blythe, we had Langy at Blythe and Jordan Watson at Blythe, and they they um, come with us to to Darlington as well. Um, so yeah, we've got um, I, I keep mentioning it to Bali, we've got a we've got a strong a strong quartet of of ex Sunderland lads. So if there's ever a, a pre-season friendly to be arranged, Bali, I'm uh, I'm expecting a a call. But no, it's um it's good, and and I think it's it, it's good them to know that obviously we've got this this kind of um, link as such so we can have chats about it and have a chat about their time obviously they come through the ranks when Bali was their coach and stuff like that and obviously I know Bali as a as a player and, and stuff like that and Bali Bali was cracking he was always great with me um, he actually helped me um, get my uh, fill my house with furniture one time I, I, had, I bought a house in Great Lumley my first house um, and I had a spare bedroom and I didn't didn't exactly have loads of money to to spend on furnishing it, and he said he had some um, bedroom spare bedroom furniture that was free to collect. So me me and Gav McCann rode over with our golf cheeky eyes and put it in the back of our golf cheeky eyes and and brought it back to <laughs> back to my gaff to, to furnish my house. Um, so yeah, I've always gotten I've always gotten really well with Bali. He's a sound bloke. Well, it used to be a bit of a tradition that we played Darlow in a pre-season friendly, so hopefully, uh, yeah. hopefully it starts up again. Good, 
good that. Yeah, whenever pre whenever preseason is. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, I mean, ju- just as a kind of a last note, I mean, I've read this week calls for support to help some football league sides, but I imagine it's, it's uh, kind of worrying and difficult at the non-league level as well. I mean, how how are things at Darlington through current time? Yeah, it's tough. I think it. it I think it's tough. I think Darlington, are, Darlington are, are trying to top our. Um, the lads' wages up. Um, they're obviously getting the eighty percent, and, and they're trying to add the the twenty percent to keep the lads' wages as as they were. But it's it's strange because I, I I spoke with Alan just um, last week with regards to the Premier League handing handing money down and stuff like that. And Alan said yeah. that the money that they're handing down was money that they were going to be handing down anyway. It, it, there's nothing there's nothing more than what the what the the Premier League was was supposedly handing down, so that was that was a bit of a bummer because I thought, oh, oh, happy days, the Premier League are helping some some lower league teams, and I think that's a shame these days. I think there's that much money now in the in the top league. I think money should be should be definitely filtered down to the leagues to keep to keep clubs afloat and to to keep them competitive. It's difficult, man. We've got like in our league, we've got some full time clubs, um, and it's hard to compete as a as a part time outfit. Fortunately, we've 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 had a good group this year, and we, we I think we were we were just shy of the playoffs, trying to compete and to to edge our way into there. But it, it it is tough in these lower leagues, and the the clubs rely on the the fans through the door and games, and a lot of them are struggling because that's obviously not not coming about. So it's it's a difficult time for for everyone. Yeah, well, let's hope uh, we can get back to some sort of normality soon, and uh, you and Alan could get cracking, <laughs> going to take and Darlow back up the leagues and get into football league. That'll be quality. Yeah, that would be nice. Well, on that note, thank you so much for your time, Darren. I've uh, you know I've loved the chance to speak uh, speak to you about those great times because um, there really were some great years. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it's only distant memory now that uh, some of them were winning every week but uh, we did once upon a time yeah it's um, been nice to reminisce we really appreciate it and and, uh, and thanks again Darren it's been great no problem <laughs>